We see the tall grass on the fields of Leah Reach reveal the path of the breezing wind. In the sky, a pair of white owls seek refuge from the approaching dawn, well fed after a successful hunt. They fly toward the city of Evergill and return home to their nest within the charred bell tower of Chiron's church. On the ground, men and women work together in unison, rebuilding their town from the damage caused by the Blood Ross clan that attacked them months ago. Amidst the crowd stands Espen Goldskill on top of a box, issuing orders with a wide smile on his face. His suit of armor replaced by a beautiful blue attire, and around his neck hangs the golden mare necklace, which starts to glitter spectacularly as the sun rises in the horizon. In Sovakai, we see Panon sit alone by a table inside a crossroad inn, enjoying the soothing sound of minstrels competing for the golden fiddle. Another time, he might have competed as well, but not now. Rather, he stares towards the door, biding his time, and as if on cue, we see a large, burly man whose head is almost hidden behind a bushy brown beard and a mane of unkept hair. He wears a suit of leather armor, and strapped to his hip is a flintlock pistol placed inside a holster. He holds a fiddle case with one hand, and in the other he flicks a coin across his fingers back and forth. By his side stands a young woman, her red hair braided into a single long ponytail that goes over her shoulder. Several scars tarnish her face, with one of them cleaving her left eyebrow in two. Like her companion, she too also wears leather armor, but rather than actual weapons, she is armed with a pair of leather gloves with spiked metal studs on the knuckles. Strapped to her back, we see a beautiful trumpet of brass, clean as if it had never been used. The two of them eye Pannon and approach him without muttering a single word. Pannon in turn gives them a disarming, genuine smile. It might have taken some time, but Pannon is now one step closer to freedom. One step closer to be rid of Rashid Narai and the other members of the Phantoms. And deep below ground, in the Dwarven Kingdom of Frostdeen, we see Brownlane standing inside a poorly lit room, surrounded by other dwarves. In hushed whispers, they form a plan to overthrow Eldith Kynegold, all so that Brownlane can become the new clan leader. But despite the vital role Brownlane plays in this plan, he has a hard time focusing on the task at hand. The dream he had a couple of days ago still stirs within his mind. While he wasn't necessarily ready to accept that a talking bear was warning him of a coming danger, he also wasn't able to ignore the dream. Perhaps it was the sight of his friends, Jason Finian, that was the reason he couldn't let it go. He knew that they too also were granted magic marks when they were stranded inside Briarworld, and it had felt surreal. The sound, the sight, the smell… But before Bramlin can finish his train of thoughts, one of the dwarves asks him a direct question, and he returns to the conversation. But it doesn't end here, for in the dark and grey shadow will, we see a dark figure walk the grey valley of Destitute, mere hours after the House of War managed to return to the material plane. His tattered priestial robe of Akan flail in the wind. With a single purpose in his mind, Ezekiel walks for hours, and then for days, and even weeks. But finally, we see him approach a black fortress. It is hard to tell at first glance, as the fortress is decorated with skulls and spikes, no doubt the effect of the Shadowfell. It is evident that this building is the foul copy of High Point Keep. We see the lids enter the keep, and within, hundreds of zombies roam the halls, wandering aimlessly. They take no heed to Ezekiel as he walks past them, until he finally stops in the middle of the hall. For a time, the lich simply stands there, unresponsive. But when he hears a thought not his own say, Begin, does Ezekiel lift his arms and cause his arcane magic to accumulate with impressive speed? The first volley of magical arrows shoot out, killing dozens of zombies. Their rotten bodies fall, and as they do, a shard of dark energy stored within leaps out and rushes to Ezekiel, who absorbs it effortlessly. The other zombies all turn their attention to the lich, and walk like drones programmed to bring down the aggressor. But Ezekiel does not falter, as he merely begins casting spell after spell continually until hours pass, and he is all that remains within the keep. His clothes are almost gone, and his bones have several fractures, but nonetheless, 
he walks out of the keep as if untouched. Empowered by this new gained energy, he faces northeast, where miles away lies Amneria, the city of lost souls. But before he can make a single step, we see high above in the sky, dark clouds form. A storm of unproportional size makes its way towards him, and emerging from the sky is a gargantuan black skeleton hand that clasps the ground with a thunderous boom, followed by a second tremor as another hand is brought down. And for the first time since Ezekiel lost control of himself, does he feel anything? Fear. Pure, undulterated fear that even as a lich, he should not feel. Especially not when his phylactery is still safe on the material plane. But the moment quickly passes, as the voice inside his head says, Return. And with no hesitation, Ezekiel brings both his hands up towards the sides of his cranium and casts a devastating spell that explodes his skull and causes his physical form to turn into dust. The gargantuan black skeleton hand reaches out towards his soul, but it misses by a slightest sliver of a margin. And in the material plane, we see a man staring into Ezekiel's phylactery, clenching his fist, but sighs with relief when the artifact gleams an eerie light when Ezekiel's soul returns. The man places his hand on the phylactery, and with a voiceless incantation, siphons all of the negative energies now stored within Ezekiel. The power pales in comparison to that of the souls the man managed to drain back in Mabelkin's underground crypt, but that matters not to the man. Rather, he lets out a roaring laughter, pleased by the result. The experiment proved successful. It will take time, that is for sure, but with the near boundless energies permeating the Shadowfell, his ascension is now only a matter of time. And the man, well, he has more than enough time. <laughs>